Hello number theorists and welcome back to our course about number theory and cryptography. In this lecture we will investigate together a famous theorem due to his excellence Euler known as Euler's theorem. Euler's theorem will be a generalization of Fermi's little theorem which let me remind you states that if p is a prime number and a is not congruent to 0 modulo p then one can deduce that a powers p minus 1 will be congruent to 1 modulo p. So Fermi's little theorem says what happens for prime numbers and the natural question is what happens if p is not a prime number we will see together that Euler's theorem gives a full answer to our question we actually can check easily that Fermi's little theorem does not work when p is not a prime number and if you take for instance n is equal to 9 and a is equal to 2 modulo 9 then a powers 8 which is 9 minus 1 is congruent to a powers 8 modulo 9 which is also congruent to 2 powers 8 modulo 9 and 2 powers 8 is actually 256 modulo 9 and this is congruent actually to 4 mod 9 and 4 modulo 9 is different as you can see from 1 modulo 9. Thus we see here that if p is not a prime number the Fermi's little theorem does not hold anymore and we will have to investigate more of the patterns that happen modulo 9 to understand what's going on. Actually Fermi's little theorem can help us reach conclusions for p times q where p and q actually are different prime numbers and for instance if you take p equals to 3 and q equals to 7 we can show easily that if n does not share any common divisor with 21 meaning that the GCD of n and 21 is equal to 1 then n powers 12 will be congruent to 1 modulo 21 actually this will be true because it is equivalent to saying that n powers 12 is congruent to 1 modulo 3 and n powers 12 is congruent to 1 modulo 7 and these are equivalent because 3 and 7 are co-prime meaning they do not share any common divisor greater than 1 now we can show this very easily using in Fermi's little theorem and this as well. Indeed, we know by Fermi's little theorem that n squared will be congruent to 1 modulo 3 and this is because n cannot be congruent to 0 modulo 3 because the GCD of n and 21 is equal to 1 so 3 cannot divide n and from this we get that n squared all power 6 is congruent to 1 power 6 which is 1 modulo 3 and we get that n power 12 is congruent to 1 modulo 3. For this one here it is the same thing n is different from 0 modulo 7 because otherwise 7 would divide n and we know from here that the GCD of n at 21 is equal to 1 so 7 cannot divide n and thus by the Fermi's little theorem one gets that n power 7 minus 1 which is n power 6 is congruent to 1 modulo 7 and if you square both sides here we get that n power 12 is congruent to 1 modulo 7 bingo from here we see that Fermi's little theorem is very helpful but it gives no answer when you work for instance modulo 9 which is a square or modulo 25 or even modulo 100 right and Euler did this work for us and investigated what happens modulo any integer m to see what happens modulo any integer m I wrote a little computer program using Python which I called here power of m and it will return the list of powers modulo m for every integer from 1 to m minus 1 so if you execute this with 9 for instance this is what we get we get these lists the first list is the powers of 1 modulo 9 which gives obviously 1 and the second list is the list of powers of 2 modulo 9 so here we see that we have 2 powers 1 which is 2 modulo 9 2 powers 2 is 4 2 powers 3 is 8 modulo 9 and 2 powers 4 is 16 modulo 9 and we know that 16 modulo 9 is the same thing as 7 modulo 9 2 powers 5 is 2 powers 4 times 2 which is 7 times 2 modulo 9 9 and 7 times 2 is 14 modulo 9 and 14 modulo 9 gives 5 modulo 9 and the first power 2 which gives 1 modulo 9 is actually 2 power 6 and we see that 2 powers 8 which is 9 minus 1 gives as we've seen previously 4 modulo 9 and it does not give 1 modulo 9 as Fermi's little theorem claims for p a prime number. Now if you get to 3 modulo 9 the first power 3 is 1 so 3 power 1 equals to 3 which is obvious and 3 squared modulo 9 is actually 0 it is the same thing for 3q 
cubed because 3 cubed is 3 squared times 3 and 3 squared is 0 modulo 9 which gives 0 and so on and so forth. So we see here that no power of 3 can give 1 modulo 9. Interesting pattern. Now if you get to 4, we see that 4 powers 1 is equal to 4. 4 squared which is 16 and 16 is the same thing as 7 modulo 9. And then 4 cubed is 7 times 4 modulo 9 of course. And 7 times 4 is the same thing as 14 times 2 and 14 is the same thing as 5. And 5 times 2 is 10 modulo 9. And this is why we get 1 modulo 9 for 4 cubed. Hence 3 is the least power of 4 which gives 1 modulo 9. We see as well actually that 4 powers 8 which is 4 powers 9 minus 1 does not give 1 modulo 9. What we see too, which is natural, once we get a 1 here, the next remainders are the same, so we get 4, 7, 1, 4, 7, 1, and 4, 7, and another 1, etc. Same thing happens to 5, 6 and 3 are the same, and so on and so forth. So what we notice here actually is that for 2, 4, 5, 7, and 8 is that 2 power 6 gives 1, 4 power 6 gives 1 as well, 5 power 6 gives 1, 7 power 6, and 8 power 6 give 1 modulo 9. Actually Euler's theorem will assert that modulo 9 if the GCD of A and 9 is equal to 1 then one can deduce that A power 6 is congruent to 1 modulo 9. So this didn't work for 3 because the GCD of 3 and 9 is not equal to 1, it is equal to 3. And this is why we did not get 1 modulo 9 and we got 0 modulo 9 instead. Now if you try this with 21 like we did before, so power of 21, we will see that if n does not share any common divisor except 1 with 21, then n powers 12 will give all the time 1 modulo 21. This is what we get, and I'll leave it to you to see that if n does not share any common divisor with 21, then n powers 12 is congruent to 1 modulo 21. And you can see here that for instance, for 7, which is not co-prime with 21, the pattern is completely different and we do not get any 1 modulo 21, right? We also see here, for instance, for 12, things does not work very well because we do not get 1 modulo 21, and this is because the GCD of 12 and 21 is equal to 3, and which is different from 1. So many patterns occur here, and I'll leave it to you to investigate these more in depth. Let us now follow Euler's great proof to prove that a power 6 is congruent to 1 modulo 9 for this particular example, which we will generalize for the general case. First of all, let me remind you that we say that a is invertible modulo 9 or modulo an integer m if and only if ax is congruent to 1 modulo m has a solution x, right? Which means that a has an inverse x. And this happens if and only if the GCD of a and m is equal to 1, meaning that a and m are co-prime. For instance, if you take m equals to 9, we see that ax is congruent to 1 modulo m if and only if the GCD of a and 9 is equal to 1. So this gives us actually all the invertible elements modulo 9, which are 1, 2, 3 is not invertible because the GCD are 3 and 9 is not equal to 1, 4 is invertible because it does not share a divisor with 9, except 1 of course, 5 as well, 7 and 8. Notice now that actually there are exactly 6 invertible elements modulo 9. And the 6 here, which is the cardinal of our set here, corresponds surprisingly to the 6 that we have here. So we will use the invertible elements to show that a power 6 is congruent to 1 modulo 9. For this matter, we will mimic Fermi's little theorem proof in order to prove our result here. So if we take a times 1 times a times 2 times a not times 3 but times 4 times a times 5 times a not times 6 but times 7. Actually, this is a times every invertible. And finally, a times 8. One guess that this is congruent congruent to 1 times 2 times 4 times 5 times 7 times 8 all times a power 6 modulo 9 right now all we have to show that this is the same thing as 1 times 2 times 4 times 5 times 7 times 8 all modulo 9 which means that this is a rearrangement of all the invertible elements 
Notice first that actually a is an invertible element because we suppose that the GCD of a and 9 is equal to 1 and here we multiply a by an invertible, here too we multiply a by another invertible, here as well, here as well, here too and here as well. We can also show that if we multiply two invertibles we get an invertible element. So these are six elements out of the invertible elements and we can also show that they're all different which means that they give a rearrangement of all the invertible elements modulo 9. This means that this product here should give 1 times 2 times 4 times 5 times 7 times 8 modulo 9. So what we got here, if we do note this capital N, we got that capital N is congruent to capital N times A power 6 modulo 9. But N is actually an invertible element because it is the product of invertible elements which means that we can simplify here by both ends to get that a power 6 is congruent to 1 modulo 9. Bingo! The general case works the same and it's all about counting the number of invertibles modulo a certain integer m here. For this matter we will denote phi of m the number of invertible elements modulo m. Phi of m is actually called Euler's totient function and this is how we spell totient. Okay, so phi of m is equal actually to the number, this is how we denote the number of a's which are between 1 and m minus 1 such that the GCD of a and m is equal to 1. Then Euler's theorem states actually that if the GCD of a and m is equal to 1 then one can deduce that a powers phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m. Why is this a generalization to Fermi's Lie's theorem? It is because actually if m is a prime number p, then phi of m is equal to p minus 1. And this is actually because the GCD of a and p for p prime number here is all the time equal to 1 if a is between 1 and p minus 1. This is obvious because a and p cannot share any common divisor greater than 1 if p is a prime number. So we get here that the number of elements is equal to p minus 1 and this actually gives us the famous theorem of Fermat which states that a powers p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p of course. Now what we would like to do is to prove this for every integer m. To do so let us denote u1, u2 until we get to u phi of m all the invertible elements modulo m. Their number is of course we denoted here phi of m and let us take a such that the GCD of a and m is equal to 1. Now what we're going to do is we will multiply a by u1 then multiply a by u2 until we get to a times u phi of m, right? What we will have to show is that this is congruent to the same thing u1 times u2 until we get to u5 of m which means that this is actually a rearrangement of all the invertible elements modulo m. So this is our first invertible, this is our second invertible until we get to the last invertible and this is because we're multiplying an invertible by another invertible. So we get an invertible number modulo m. So if this is congruent to this modulo m what we see here is that if you rearrange this here we get that u1 times u2 until we get to u phi of m times a powers phi of m of course because a here occurs phi of m times is congruent to u1 times u2 times u phi of m modulo m this is great because from both sides here we have the same element which is invertible and which means that we can simplify both sides and get that a powers phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m. Now this is not very rigorous because we will have to show that we can cancel both of these and we will have to show actually this here more rigorously to see that this is actually a rearrangement of all the invertible elements. It is not very difficult but we will have to do it anyways. First of all notice if a times ui is congruent to a times uj 
modulo m such that i is different from j, then because actually the GCD of a and m is equal to 1, we know that we can simplify both sides by a here to get that ui is congruent to uj modulo m. Now all we have to do is to show that a ui is all the time an invertible element and this is because actually the product of two invertible elements is all the time an invertible element. This is actually a very general statement and if you take x to be invertible and y to be another invertible then we know from here that there exists another x prime such that x x prime is congruent to 1 modulo m. From here we know that there exists a y prime such that y y prime is congruent to 1 modulo m and if you multiply both of these one gets that x y x prime y prime is congruent to 1 modulo modulo actually m which means that actually the inverse of x y is x prime y prime bingo so the product of two invertibles modulo m is an invertible element and this leads us to our conclusion that this product here is a rearrangement of all the invertible elements thus this one here is congruent to the product of the invertible elements u1 until u5 of m bingo so this gives us Euler's theorem, which is a generalization to Fermat's little theorem. Let us now apply Euler's theorem to a concrete example. And for instance, if you take m equals 8, then Euler's theorem states that if the GCD of a and m is equal to 1, meaning here m is equal to 8, then a powers phi of 8 is congruent to 1 modulo 8. So all we have to do here is to compute phi of 8, right? And phi of 8, let me remind you, is the number of elements modulo m for which the GCD of a and 8 is equal to 1. The set of numbers co prime to 8 is 1, 2 is not co prime with 8, we have 3, 4 is not co prime, we have 5, 6 is not co prime with 8, we have 7, and that's all. So actually here, we see that 5 8 is equal to 4 which means that a powers 4 will always be congruent to 1 modulo 8 for of course all the a's which are co-prime with 8. For those who are skeptical let us go on python and see the powers modulo 8 and you will see that those which are co-prime with 8 verify this condition. So we execute our function power with the number 8 and this is what we get we should get a powers 4 is congruent to 1 modulo 8 and this is actually the case because for 1 it is the case obviously for 2 is not the case because 2 and 8 are not co-prime for 3 it is true for 5 it is true and for 7 it is true as well see so Euler's theorem works very well in this case and in the general case as well now the natural question actually that we have is how to compute phi of m for any integer m we will answer this question in our future lecture. So this is the end of our lecture about Euler's theorem and we will investigate as promised in the future lecture how to compute Euler's totient function. Thank you for listening.